Hello and welcome back. Um, we are studying the um, spline functions as I have uh, perhaps hinted in the previous lecture. Uh, so what we have observed is that until now we have been interpolating the given function, the given data of the function by means of a single polynomial. And what we would want to do is uh, to do it in a more effective way. That's because whenever we have high degree polynomials, then the uh, fluctuation can be large, even though you may only change the entries, the variables x by a small margin. And therefore, instead of uh, interpolating the data by a single polynomial, perhaps of a very high degree, because for uh, better approximation, better precision, you will need to have many points. So what we would want to do is to do a piecewise polynomial interpolation. This is what we would want to do. So this is the alternative approach, which is that you have the whole interval and you divide it into a collection of sub intervals and construct an approximating polynomial on each of these sub intervals. So this is what we are going to do. And this has a name. It's called piecewise polynomial interpolation, but it's also called a spline. The word spline is the uh, word which is uh, well accepted in the whole community. So this is the word that we are going to try and use from now on. So what could be the simplest spline? The simplest spline perhaps is the linear spline. So what we do in this is that we have this data x0, fx0, x1, fx1, x2, fx2, and so on up to xn, fxn. And we join them by a series of straight lines. This is what we do. This is the most natural thing that one would want to do. But a disadvantage of the linear spline is that there is likely no differentiability at the end points. And therefore, the function that we are going to get, it's not going to be smooth. It will have some edges. It will have some peaks or maybe valleys. So this is not going to give you the function that you define on the whole interval x0 to xn. That will not be differentiable. It will not be smooth function. So we would want to have the smooth property as much uh, as we can. And uh, that's clear from the physical conditions that smoothness will be required. And therefore, linear spline is something that we simply cannot consider. This is how it would look. You know, for instance, if you look at the um, linear polynomial approximating the given function or interpolating the given function in the interval x j plus 1 and x j plus 2, then we see that it's almost horizontal. Whereas the next one is not horizontal, the previous one is also not horizontal. So the points x j plus 1 and x j plus 2, these are the two points where we are not going to have the differentiability. And uh, therefore, we cannot consider linear spline. We go to the next one and uh, quadratic spline perhaps. So the simplest differentiable spline on the entire interval x0, xn is the function obtained by fitting a quadratic polynomial between each successive pairs of nodes. So what we do is that you have a quadratic from x0 to x1, which agrees with the function on x0 and also on x1. Then you have another quadratic from x1 to x2, agreeing with the function on x1 to x2, and so on. This is what we are going to do. And there is some bit of a freedom that we have. We have some flexibility, and then we will have to impose some conditions. So a general quadratic polynomial, which looks like a plus bx plus c x square. So to describe the quadratic polynomial, we have to describe these three constants, a, b, and c, or it's the constant term, the coefficient of x, and the coefficient of x square. These are the three terms which we have to define. So we have flexibility of degree 3, one may say. And further, only two conditions are required to fit the data at the end point. So we have to have that the end point. So if it's, say, from uh, the end point xj to xj plus 1, then at xj, it should have a certain value. At xj plus 1, it should have a certain value. So those two conditions will guarantee that you can determine two of the three constants. You still have one more degree of uh, freedom. 
so we have the flexibility to be able to choose the quadratics so that we have a continuous derivative so not just that the functions agree on the endpoints you may also choose that the derivatives agree inside the interval open interval x0 to xn the difficulty arises because we will also need to have that at the endpoints our interpolant the function that we are describing to interpolate your function f that interpolant should be differentiable this is the thing and we would want to have some condition on its differentiability at the two endpoints x0 and x1 and that is the problem so there is not a sufficient number of constants to ensure that these conditions will be satisfied okay so what we are saying is that although the quadratic has three constants and we have conditions on that uh, on the whole quadratic spline which will ensure that we can not just have a continuous spline but we have a continuously differentiable spline so that at each of the midpoints on um, each of the nodes other than x0 and x1 we will have that the spline uh, part x, sj agrees with the spline part sj plus 1 and sj prime agrees with sj pr plus 1 prime we can have that but then we have exhausted all our constants we have exhausted all our freedom and uh, we cannot impose any further conditions and uh, so there that's a problem let's try to understand this with one of the simplest possible cases so suppose we have three nodes we have a which is x0 then there is an x1 and then there is an x2 so this is the um, simplest possible case that we are going to look at and now a quadratic spline for us will consist of two quadratic polynomials you will have s0 on x0 to x1 and you will have s1 from x1 to x2 and we can write the polynomials as uh, the usual polynomials a plus bx plus cx square but we may also write it as a0 plus b0 x minus x0 plus c0 x minus x0 square we can also write it in this way and similarly s1 can be written in the following way there is a benefit of writing it in this way the reason is very clear now because once you put the value of s0 x0 you remember that s0 is from x0 to x1 so at the initial point x0 its value should be f of x0 which tells you that the constant a0 has to be f of x0 okay and similarly s1 of x1 which is a1 because we have written our polynomial s1 x in that particular way precisely for this reason that when you put the values of x0 in s0 and s x1 in s1 we should get some simpler expressions so a1 is f of x1 okay so a0 is determined a1 is determined and in between the point x1 will have some derivative and we demand that the s1 prime has to be f prime now if you compute s1 prime the derivative of s1 a1 vanishes it's a constant term next term is a linear term that gives you only b1 and then you have 2c x minus x1 so when you put x1 in the derivative of s1 you get only b1 and so that has to be f prime of x1 so b1 is determined a1 is determined b1 is determined this is for s1 for s0 only a0 is determined we have some more conditions we have that the value of the first quadratic s0 at the second end point which is x1 should be the value of s1 at x1 which is f of x1 so that gives you some equation in terms of b0 and c0 okay further we have s0 prime has to be f prime at x1 which is equal to b1 so these are the two conditions which will help you determine b0 and c0 because the first equation s0 x1 equal to f of x1 involves writing it as b0 x1 minus x0 plus c0 x1 minus x0 whole square and s0 prime will give you something like b0 plus 2 c0 x1 minus x0 and if you look at the two 
variables which are b naught and c naught whom we would want to compute and two equations then the determinant of this thing is non zero so think about it perhaps it will come as uh, a question in the examination who knows so that allows you to determine b naught and c naught uniquely okay so we have been able to determine a naught b naught c naught a1 and b1 and finally we have that s1 x2 has to be f of x2 because the value of the interpolant has to agree with the function values on x naught x1 and x2 so that gives you that s1 x2 will which will give you an equation for this s1 which is the a1 b1 c1 in terms of x2 minus x1 x2 minus x1 whole square but since x1 is less than x2 you can solve for this and get the value for c1 so our constants a0 b0 c0 a1 b1 c1 are all determined now and therefore the whole spline is uniquely determined and what we have not yet used is the set of boundary conditions so what about s0 s prime x0 equal to f prime x0 or s prime x2 equal to f prime x2 if we want to have these conditions as well then we will not be able to impose them because we have no more freedom left with us our spline is now completely determined by the inside data and only the function values on the two the outermost end points so this is a problem with the quadratic spline and so the natural thing to do is to go to the next level and this is really the most common piece wise polynomial interpolation uh, which uses cubic polynomials between each pair of nodes each successive pair of nodes and we call it a cubic spline and good thing about it is that there are now four constants we have one more degree of freedom for each sub interval so we have a sufficient flexibility for the cubic spline procedure to ensure that the interpolant is not only continuously differentiable on the interval but also has a continuous second derivative so we will have that the interpolant which is given by sj and if the next one is sj plus 1 we will have that sj and sj plus 1 agree on the midpoint on the common point between the two sub intervals sj prime agrees with sj plus 1 prime and we will also be able to have that sj double prime equal to sj plus 1 double prime just having equality of these two is something that is going to be possible however the construction will not assume that the derivative of the interpolant agrees with the derivative of the function that would be some more set of uh, equations which we are not having right now even at the nodes we will not assume that okay so let me give you the exact definition of the cubic spline so let's start with a function f defined on the closed and bounded interval ab and suppose we have these nodes x0 x1 up to xn and you know typically until now we have been writing nodes as x0 comma x1 comma dot 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 comma xn but here we are specifying some inequality sign between them because we have to talk about the intervals i think it is very important for you to know that when you are looking at the interval ab and if your a is not smaller than b if a is bigger than b then that interval is zero the definition of an interval ab is the set of real numbers which are bigger than or equal to the first point and less than or equal to the second point so the interval will be otherwise empty that is why we are using this inequality sign okay so we are starting with a function defined on this interval ab and we have a set of nodes x0 up to xn then a cubic spline interpolant capital s for our function f is a function that satisfies this following condition so what are the conditions it should be a cubic on each sub interval xj to xj plus 1 it's the interpolant is a cubic polynomial sj what are the properties that this sj should have on the two end points xj and xj plus 1 sj should agree with the function values okay and the 
derivatives as well as the double derivatives of sj and sj plus 1 have to agree on the common points which is the xj plus 1. These are the conditions that we impose on our spline and uh, there could be some boundary conditions that we may impose. So even after this we will have some degrees of freedom which we can use to impose two boundary conditions and they are called you may declare that the second derivatives are zero at the external endpoints which are x0 and x1 and this is called a natural boundary because you are not imposing anything on sj prime the s0 prime and the s n minus 1 prime you are not imposing anything on the derivative you are only saying that the next derivative has to be zero so this is called a natural boundary and finally we have a clamped boundary where you declare that your derivatives on the external endpoints have to be the same as the derivative of the function on those two endpoints. So we have a natural boundary condition or we have clamped boundary conditions and therefore the cubic spline will then be respectively called a natural cubic spline or a clamped cubic spline. And just to tell you how the picture would look like, this is how it would look like that you would have sj, sj plus 1 and on this common point, you should have that the function values agree, the derivative values agree and the second derivative values agree. So in the coming lectures, we are going to see how we can construct these uh, cubic splines. We will have to study the errors that we are going to have. That's what we have always been doing in this course. And uh, then we will go on. This is going to be the last part of our theme on interpolation. And then we will go on to the next thing. So hang on and stay tight. We will soon be meeting. This is a small lecture, but uh, I don't want to introduce too many things in the very, this lecture because introducing further things would take maybe uh, some more time and it would be better that I do it in the next lecture. So I see you in the next lecture. Thank you.